the effervescent and the ebullient Reverend Sonia Davidson. Over to you, Sonia. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. And I also include in that people from the Help Me, the World Wide Web. You know, I was going to disappoint Reverend Michael this morning and be my usual very quiet, calm self. But I, <laughs> uh, since he made that, you know, I have to, um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, you know, I must say that this song this morning, what a wonderful world, is what was ringing in my mind as I drove through our beautiful, fabulous country in a bus. Have you ever driven in the, the nuts for the express? It is to be recommended because when you're driving, you really can't fully appreciate what's going on. And then you're high up, so you're seeing everything. What a wonderful country we live in. It is gorgeous, and by the time you have driven to and from, it's like a healing balm just comes over you. And in addition to that, um, yesterday I went to a lovely, uplifting Thanksgiving service of one of my um, schoolmates from St. Hilda's, who is also the sister of Sonia Brown. Do you notice what is happening? A very subtle transformation is taking place um, in the human race. You rarely ever go to a Thanksgiving service that is anything other than uplifting. And there is just so much sharing and love and people recognizing that they hadn't seen each other for a while. So I really am charged because her life is an inspiration for some of what I will speak about this morning. A very quiet, reserved young lady who lived far away from the Madding crowd, yet she was able to instill into so many people who knew her and many who had not even met her but she was contributing her love, her peace, her joy, her quiet joy to the human race. So I came back deciding that I would be a little more quiet in the way I presented myself. <laughs> a quiet fire burning within me. <laughs> so my talk is a carryover from Reverend John's talk last week when he spoke about, he, he used as his inspiration, right? The 23rd Psalm, he restoreth my soul, right? And I have decided to spend a little time with it, but I start with this quote, choose ye this day whom you will serve, from Joshua 24, verses 14 to 16. And he said, choose ye this day whom you will serve. As for me and my household, I will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. You see, Joshua was having a little challenge with his congregation of Israelites. He, they were not conforming to what was expected of them and what they were challenged to in all of the, their writings, their scriptures. So he was having a little social challenge. So what he did, and that's putting it mildly, they were really rebelling and departing from their teaching and deciding that they wanted to worship idols. So he called, he selected the leaders from the different sectors, he brought them together, and he challenged them he spoke to them with some urgency because he saw where they, in which direction they were heading because of their choices, their choices of uh, mental choices. And he predicted for them the consequences of the path that they appeared to have chosen. And then he said, choose ye this day who you may serve. And he said, okay, you are free to choose. But as for me and my household, 
I will serve the Lord. I will choose the direction in which my thoughts go. You know, this very strong leader like Moses was required for that kind of period of transition as the Israelites were being led through the wilderness. But you know, that journey is a metaphor for our own journey, our inner journey, ourselves. And the choices that are being made is between the direction of our thoughts may, may go and where we must lead them. These memorable words that Joshua chose was reminding the Israel of its past blessings, the Israelites that is, that it had received and they had received it because of their adherence to a chosen path. It had come from God, not because of any Herculean effort on their path, but because they had allowed themselves to be led by God and not be fooled by false beliefs, which we call idols. So he emphasized the necessity for them to adhere to the path of obedience to God and urged them to go even further than, the, than the, where they had gone before because with what you, they already know and once they begin to get back onto the path, they would be in a position to take themselves even higher. Sometimes when we indulge ourselves and think in a way that is not befitting what we know we should be thinking about. Things happen and we learn the lessons and when we get back on the path, we can use these lessons to rise up even higher than before. Now, I had a little experience coming on the, and I shared it before and I think it can bear sharing because it, it keeps coming back to me whenever I would deviate from the path. I was taking the Knotsford and have, I'd taken it before and I loved it. And the journey to Ocherius, to Montego Bay was beautiful. The journey coming back would have been fine, except the bus was late, which is not something that they do. So the driver decided that he wanted to make up time. No, I distest fast driving, right? And that's one of the reasons that I chose that, the bus. On top of that, the bus was making a horrible noise. And when he was driving faster, we were being bounced around the place. And I said, oh no, this is not Knotsford. And then we wanted to charge the phone. You know, we have the luxury of, of charging the phone on the buses. There was no place to charge a phone. And there was no television. I said, no, this is really not the bus that I would have chosen but my consciousness appeared to have chosen it and I was getting, you know, a little bit hot under the collar, maybe even a little bit afraid. I said, what's going on here? Is this the bus that's going to take me on that highway? And I decided, no, 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 this uneasiness is not right. So we went on when we get to, got to Ocherius. No, we stopped and the bus was behaving even worse. So making even louder noises but the driver was relentless. He decided it was going to go on. When we, are, we had gone up the first part of the inclination um, on the highway and we're about to take the first flat, the bus stopped. The driver said nothing to us. He came out, he looked, he examined the bus, he turned around and he came back in and he sat down for a while, looked perplexed and he went back out. And then after a long while, he came back in and said um, that we, have a, we are having a problem with the boss here, right? He didn't tell us what was going to happen, but after about 10 minutes, a new boss came up, right? But what I didn't tell you is that I did not allow myself to remain in that state of consciousness. I did what we should do. What did we do? We prayed, and I didn't pray for a right boss, you know. I prayed for peace and safety and a wonderful journey. And then this beautiful bus came up. It had, I could charge the phone. It was, uh, um, it had um, a cable, television. And 
The driver was perfect and the bus was smooth all the way. The thing is, choose ye this day who you will serve. Well, I was, should I have remained in that consciousness? I didn't even imagine that we could change our bus halfway along the journey. I didn't think about that. I didn't instruct the law to change the bus. I just instructed my own consciousness to choose the direction in which it should go. So, choose ye this day who will serve. From time to time, we may meet challenges. Do we want to remain in that state and indulge ourselves, right? Or do we want to direct ourselves into that state of awareness that will automatically bring to us the kind of circumstances that we will need. We have no responsibility for trying to bring about the conditions, right? Maybe I would have been perfectly calm on the same bus all the way, maybe not. But the universe decided that this is the bus I needed because there are so many other things that were required for safety. And the, the driver did, who came, although we were behind time, he was quite satisfied to drive at a pace that was conducive to my peace of mind. Right. <laughs> so we go to the fact that Reverend John spoke about he restoreth my soul. And I'm going to just refresh you for those of you who have forgotten the Lord Shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, right? I shall not want. There's nothing that I could ever want to have that has not been already provided. And he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. The green pastures is a consciousness of abundance which knows that everything already is given. He leadeth me beside the still waters. When you are in that state of consciousness, then the still waters is you are ready now to plunge into this, that still waters, to be quiet, to be, to be re re refreshed, rejuvenated, so that the soul will be restored. And where I want to focus, he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. And then it ends. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now I'm not going to go through all of this. My focus is going to be, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But to live, I want you to know that to live in the goodness and mercy and to know that it will follow you all the days of your life and that we'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever, right? Meaning we will dwell in that consciousness of the awareness of the presence of the kingdom of heaven, which is really within, that's the house of the Lord where we will be in that state that we wish to be in, of peace, of joy, of all that connotes the presence of God to us. And I say that there are conditions. There are conditions. What conditions? Conditions. Surely God's love is unconditional? Yes. God's love is already given. True. But there are conditions. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. Friends, if you have not taken a definite and determined stance to walk in the path of righteousness, it is so easy to be influenced by the opinions of those who have not yet made that choice. We live in an unseen, maybe undetected sea of human historical, unseen to us, unseen human historical and current beliefs, opinions, superstitions, predictions, and emotions. We call this collective, the collective consciousness of the human race, or race belief. Many of these are life enhancing, some are not. Sometimes we think that we can hide away from this 
by keeping to ourselves, avoiding anything that would create a negative impression in our consciousness. And that's good. That's where we should be. Because if we are going to face the negative um, affirmations about life, and we are not readily in a, in a consciousness which repels it, then it is best that we do that. But we do not escape it by hiding even under our beds. Because undetected by us, our own beliefs, opinions, superstitions, predictions, and emotions are being amplified by a law of attraction by that same collective consciousness of the human race. But we are also contributing to the human conscious, race consciousness by our own prevailing beliefs, opinions, superstitions, predictions, and emotions. Friends, you know, I have observed even people who are very practiced in this teaching and have accepted it and are living it out under conditions where they're not bombarded face on with negatives are happily going along their way but sometimes are seduced into following the path that is put to a group consciousness that is going in an opposite direction to where they had intended to go. Mm, you notice I'm being diplomatic, but I hope you get, the, you hope I get, you get what I'm saying, right? I have seen it, and when your mind is trained, you have a trained consciousness. You have a responsibility, and you have the authority to use it to induce into any space, any group consciousness, the affirmative statements that, it will, that will shift that way of thinking and speaking away into what is affirmative. You do not have the luxury of contributing to it because it will fly back to you as fast as you put it into that collective consciousness. You have a duty and a responsibility. In the quiet of your bedrooms, and also in the clamor of Facebook, or what's the other thing again? WhatsApp and the other things, right? The social media, right? Because I can tell you, even when people are not interacting with you, hundreds, maybe thousands of people are seeing what you are seeing. They are watching you and they can benefit from your uplifted consciousness. And guess what? I can recall Dr. Elma Lumsden, the founder of this center. She would often say, we must live by choice and not by chance, implying that to live by chance, we'll have to take whatever comes. And whatever comes may not be exactly to our liking, right? So we live by choice. So choose ye this way who you will serve, and you will step out on that pathway of righteousness with a choice of the consciousness that you would want to see reflected in your life in concrete, physical, visible terms of experiences. The biblical teaching frequently encourages us to choose righteousness. In Ephesians, St. Paul alluded to the breastplate of righteousness as a prerequisite for dealing with the challenges that were faced by his followers. Righteousness is not a doing word, it is a status of mind which thinks affirmatively and which understands from whence cometh our good. Adam Clark puts it this way, righteousness defends everything on which a man's spiritual life depends. We in the science of mind refer to righteousness as right useness of the mind. Righteousness is a state of spontaneous right thinking which leads to spontaneous right action and subsequently to spontaneous joyous fulfillment. That is our desire to 
live in spontaneous, joyous fulfillment. The deep spoken or unspoken desire of everyone. But to attain this, we must choose to be led into the path of righteousness. For of ourselves we do nothing. It is a Father within that doeth the work. So he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. It means when we are conscious of the what leads us, who leads us, then we are in fact setting out on the path, fully girded with the breastplate of righteousness. When we have taken the decision that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, right? That is me and my household. Guess what the household is? Our collective consciousness, our own collective, where we tend to put our thoughts and our beliefs in any moment of where we have to make a quick decision. We have decided that it is possible to live in a state of peace, love, and plenty, and that we deserve to and intend to and are determined to realize this state. Then what happens? We are now willing to make a commitment to live and pursue that state in the path of righteousness. Commitment, as Net Accord expressed it in a discovery after church discussion session, and I'm throwing it out to you people. These sessions are very deep, and there are things which come out of the collective experience that are rich, and it is another, it is another path that this church has offered to our congregants. It is not a substitute, it is another path. And dear Net Accord, in a moment of extreme clarity, said words which I did not write, but I'm going to paraphrase it because this is how I understood him to mean it. He says, when you are committed to an intention, you will be willing to be faithful to it, relentless in pursuing it until it is achieved, knowing that the outcome is assured and that you are drawing on the infallible indwelling law and love of God to accomplish that which you set out to achieve. Long, but you understand it, I paraphrased it. His, he came with such clarity, and it was as if it was a streaming through him, that when I turned and said, repeat it, right? it was difficult for him to repeat it exactly that way. But basically he said, when you make a commitment to a path, then you have to set your intention and be willing to be faithful to that intention and relentlessly pursue it until you get the outcome that you desire. But that outcome can only be assured because you know that in pursuing it, you are drawing on the infallible law and love of God in order to achieve this. The reward of commitment are the fruits of the Spirit. To be led in the paths of righteousness begins, yes, with a strong desire. But sometimes we just stop at the desire. But we have to follow up with an intention. In the beginning, it might be enough just to have the desire and follow up with an intention. Because out of that intention, grows naturally and spontaneously the other path, the rest of the path. But, you know, it does help. It's a catalyst. Just like when we plant a seed, it will grow by virtue of its own nature when it is given the right conditions. And the desire and intention is the right condition. But it does help to give it a little water in, right? And it certainly helps not to put some big rock stones of doubt on top of it, right? It will find a way around the rock stone, but it will take a little longer. And sometimes when we have planted a seed of a desire, 
then we have a whole stream of, of negative thoughts and doubts that come and we need to rebuke them firmly, right? And go back resolutely to our intention and hold steadfast to our commitment. You see, when you make a commitment, you know, it is going to be that which you keep forever and ever. It's not, commitment is not something you change your mind and say, boy, sure. You can, you know, that is why it's important not to choose how the result will come about, but to choose what you want and be committed to it until it manifests itself. So the spiritual path is not one of struggle and sacrifice. It is not about doing good, although it will lead to being good. It does not have to be a pilgrim's progress, and it certainly is not the impossible dream of Don Quixote. Read about pilgrim's courses. I hear at one stage it was read, that book was read, second only, the most popular book, second only to the Bible. And Don Quixote, we know, because some of us have seen the movie da Man from La Mancha, where he um, set out to fight windmills. Incidentally, these two great books are metaphors for life. And even though they are not science of mind books, it's good to train our minds to look for the principle wherever we find it. Because a law is a law, and therefore it is everywhere. Right? Evenly and equally. So the, to follow the path, we need a clear goal. To know where we are going, we need to know the path. And we need a compass to point to where we intend to go in case we go off track. So without threat of contradiction, I can say for everyone, as I say for myself, that we all want to live the best possible lives. A young South African artist put it this way. I would like to be the best version of myself that I can possibly be. And I would like to make it visible in my art. I say I'd like to make it visible in my life. For me, I would say in my life. To live the best possible version of myself, my compass is peace. Anything which is inclined, which I'm inclined to do, which does not come with the greatest sense of peace, means I'm off track and must redirect my path. It means that I am out of alignment with my best version of myself, which is my God self. So I listen and feel what is going on. That's the gift that God has given us, the feeling, so we'll know when to, you know, shift. Personalness of God, yes. It is easy to accept that God is not some far off old man with a beard and a logbook, but I must upgrade my realization to that which defies a description, but which I know as myself, as that which I am aware of in everyone and in everything and every experience, no matter what, and in which that awareness and, and which is the awareness of blissfulness that I find in myself. I do not have to make the sacrifice of giving up certain pet peeves and lingering resentments. I do have to make the sacrifice of giving up certain pet peeves and lingering resentments, and I definitely, right, have to give up any idea that I have to make anything happen. The greatest handicap to spiritual co progress, where um, Ernest Holmes said, um, in his question and answer in the science of mind, and that's a free book which I said the last time I was here, that is on the internet, you can download it. He said it's a lack of belief in the actual presence of spirit directing and the law as obeying. The spirit is that within you which tells you which way to go and you just have to connect with it and a law which obeys you. Once you have decided, you take no responsibility. You just say that. That's it. And he says we have to accept that there's a, um, if there's a spontaneous acceptance of good, as being an absolute power over the appearance of evil. For myself, I know the need to discipl for discipline is a, as a ritual, which keeps me on a path by reminding me who I serve, meaning who is doing the work, a discipline which programs me into the certainty that I am in that place where God shows up until my idea of God is replaced by um, not by God and I, but God as I. My morning ritual, 
goes this way. Yes? It requires a sacrifice, but it is a sacrifice that says, what? No more than, Ernest Hood says, that sacrifice is no more than bidding to pay, to fill up your gas tank when you need gas, or paying the toll on the highway, that I say that, right? And the so-called sacrifice is of giving up the idea that I don't have enough time. When I get up in the morning, oh, I have to worry, worry, worry. No. Here goes my morning ritual. I wake up, I lie still for five to ten minutes in an awareness of awe at the miracle of sleep and gratitude for the gift of life. Let's face it. I just had my awareness go somewhere. My body went with it to be refreshed and revived without my conscious participation. That's a miracle. Now I'm awake. No, I'm awake and I have an opportunity to choose how I will use the gift of life. Realizing that the only time I have is now. And not wanting to waste a moment, I sit up and meditate for 20 minutes. Pray for three to five minutes. I read what my hand guides me to by way of some inspiring book. My, 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 my bookshelf is right beside me and I grab any book that my hand gives. I open it and whatever the message is, it's there for me. I exercise for 20 minutes to flood the brain with blood and oxygen and energize that instrument which my mind is going to use for the day. I join my Facebook friends, carefully chosen friends, for any time left, share something that inspires me, respond appropriately when indicated, bathe, please, I bathe my mind, now I bathe my body, I dress, set my intention, of, full, of doing fulfilling service and uh, having a blissfully happy day. And off I go. The value of collective worship, though, that's my individual thing. But I put to you the value of collective worship. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there will I be also. Collective spiritual activity enhances the space and scale of our progress. Ernest Holmes, in answer to someone who is seeking a simple, direct approach to understanding and applying the universal law in a quest for spiritual unfoldment, said, know that you are surrounded by an intelligence operating through perfect law. Believe that what the sages and the saints have known, you can know also. Let nothing stand in your way of it, and believe with all your might that spirit is making itself manifest through you. He also adds, keep it simple. Put your thoughts into your own words. Once you decide that around you, within you, is that spirit supports, which supports you, and that law which obeys you, then you direct it in your own words. But you have to start with knowing that. That is the first thing. And then you direct it. Then you say, make your goal big. The best possible version of yourself, remember that's what you're making. And decide that, no, like a dibby dibby wave or sea foam for me, right? I am part of a sea, an infinite sea of possibilities. I can become a tsunami, a tsunami for good. And affirm like this, that is what I would share with you, but make up your own. The continuous activity of spirit is made manifest in my life and affairs. The continuous or you can say continual, whichever you prefer. I like continuous activity of spirit is made manifest in my life and affairs. And I want you to say that with me. Let me repeat it. The continuous activity of spirit, the continuous activity of spirit is made manifest, is made manifest in my life and affairs. Let us say it right through. The continuous activity of spirit is made manifest in my life and affairs. Namaste.